come and put five dollars in the celebration jar, which I agreed to do. And he also told me two other things. I'll tell you about the celebration jar in a minute. But he told me two other things in prayer that God will raise godly men up and the world will not fall. So he said that to me this morning. And then when I came into church, someone let me know that the prayer of healing came true. And that's why I put the $5 in, but I didn't know till I came through this door this morning. Thank you. This is the joy of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've talked about Hannah, I think, the whole time we've been in this church. And uh, Hannah had issues that were difficult. She would fall downstairs. Hannah is my granddaughter. And uh, gradually she got better and uh, she was able to uh, uh, have a little girl from, uh, yeah. She wasn't adopted yet, but they took her in and they had her for three years hoping to adopt her, and this year it came through. She is now adopted by Hannah's and Ethan's family, and we're so blessed through that. <laughs> this is the joy of the Lord. Are there any other celebrations? All right. As we move into the bulk of our worship service this morning. Let's start with prayer. God, our King, all glorious above, we come to you this morning to tell of your might and sing of your grace and generous blessings. With spring knocking at our door, with new life poking through the earth, we too want to feel renewed. We ask your blessing on this service and all involved, whether leading or listening, standing or sitting, with true adoration, we bring you praise. Holy Spirit, come. Focus our hearts and our minds on you. Still, whatever distractions may be in our heads and our hearts, that we may worship your holy name together. Amen. Let's stand together as you are able and sing, O Worship the King. Children of dust and 
the lighting of the Christ candle at a fitting moment. It is my joy and delight to be with you here this morning, and thank you so much for welcoming Mike and I into your presence this weekend. Even more so, our God, our maker and defender, redeemer and friend, delights in gathering us to this place this morning to worship his holy name. Listen to these words from Paul's letter to God's holy people in the city of Colossae as a reminder 
as to why we come to worship. We come asking God to fill us with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Please rise in body or in spirit. This God, our God who has welcomed us into the kingdom of light, greets us this morning. May the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, may the bountiful love of our Heavenly Father, and the abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer. a redeemer, God's own son. There is hope for sinners, and thanks be to God. With that assurance, let us come before God with our honest confession. Let us pray. Loving God, 
we confess before you and each other that our lives are not pure and holy apart from the cleansing we have from the work of Christ. And we confess that too often Christ in us is hidden by our actions, actions that wound rather than heal, that tear down rather than build up. Open our eyes that we may see you in the ones we say we love. Open our ears that we may be quicker to listen than to speak. Open our mouths to speak good rather than evil of our neighbors. Open our hands in generosity and help us let go of clenched fists. Open our hearts to a desire to follow Jesus in full obedience to your will and your way. We pray, trusting in your forgiveness and in the power of your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in the paths of justice and righteousness. For your name's sake, amen. Our words of assurance come from Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's respond in song with Speak, O Lord. You may stand as you are able. <clears throat> Speak, O Lord, till your church is built, and 
our kingdom kids to come forward and sit with me up here. Okay, well, you come here. Yeah, I'm glad to see you this morning. Are there all people here to see you? You think there's going to be so many kids this morning? I like kids. I know. My kids are a little bigger than you, so I like to see little kids, too. How old are my kids? Oh, well, my daughter, Clara, is 16, but she's going to turn 17 in a few weeks. And my son, Nicholas, is 13. Oh, does that feel old to you? Ooh. Well, I want to talk to you about names today. Yeah, names. E what about names? Ooh, a couple types of names. So each one of us was given a name when we were born. Wow. That's fun to have so many special names, isn't it? Well, my mom and dad, when I was born, gave me the name Jana. Do you want to tell me what name you were given? I can guess maybe the first one. Reuben? Yeah, because that's because it means three different things. <laughs> Oh, yes. Do any of the other kids here want to tell me what your name is? Oh, we got to go one at a time. Okay, should we start over here? Hi, Charlie. Okay, anybody else? That's okay. Oh. Can I tell you about a different kind of name? So here's the funny thing. My mom and dad named me Jana when I was born, but my dad does not call me Jana. He has a nickname for me. You want to know what the nickname is? So my dad calls me Peanut. Ooh. Yeah. So here's the really funny thing. I'm kind of grown up now, aren't I? Mm-hmm. And my dad still calls me Peanut. So I don't live with my dad anymore. But I'll call him up on the phone, and you know what he'll say? Hi, Peanut. <laughs> and then I'll go visit him sometimes, and it'll be lunchtime. And you know what he'll say to me? Hey, Peanut, can you make me a sandwich? He really likes the sandwiches I make. He really likes Reuben's, too. You have a peanut sandwich. Is that mean you're cannibal? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good thing he does not like peanut butter and jelly. Okay. He prefers meat and cheese, a good swash of mayo. Yeah, some lettuce and tomato. Yeah. And then... Do peanut butter sandwiches? Do I? We're going to have to talk about that later. But that's a good question to talk about later. Oh, my word. Can I wrap this, kind of bring this back? Okay. So when I, get, when I say goodbye to my dad, you know what he does? We give each other a big hug, and he says, I love you, Pete. Yeah, you got it. But you know what I really, really, really love? I actually like being called Peanut by my dad. Because when my dad calls me Peanut, it makes me feel loved. And it makes me feel held by my dad. 
But now sometimes, sometimes there's names that maybe we don't like that people call us. Animals love peanuts, so that's also kind of a blessing to the animals. Yeah, we're still on that peanut thing, aren't we? So there is a name that I don't like it when people call me it. Can you guess? I'm going to guess. You don't like it when children call you by your first name. Well, I don't mind that. Jana Banana. I don't like it when people call me Jana Banana. And maybe you have some names that you're called sometimes that you, it, it doesn't make you feel very loved or held. I know, I know a person in my class named Anna, and her nickname is Anna Banana. She might like it, she might not, right? She does love oh, she loves it. Oh, okay. She loves my comedy. Oh, and she, well, see. I think sometimes we have to pay attention to whether people like the names we call them or not. It's a good thing to ask them. But you know what? When somebody maybe calls me a name that maybe isn't my favorite, I like to think about and remind myself of what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that each one of us is wonderfully made by God and that God calls us by name. Now, I like to think that God uses the name that makes us feel loved and held. And here's the other really cool thing. The Bible tells us that God engraves our names on the palm of his hand. Do you know what engraved means? Yeah. Right? And it's really hard to get your name off that stone, isn't it? It's like there permanently. Or you could like it. You can it off. Actually, no. Or you could just scratch it out with the You could not thing. scratch it out. Okay. Well, I think. You can't scratch it out. Yeah. Pain if it's no, we got a lot of things to talk about over lunch, I think. But what I like about that image, what I like about that image is that it's really hard to get our names off of God's palm. And the Bible reminds us that our names are written in God's book of life. And I really, really like that. Can I pray with you this morning? Okay. Dear God, may each of these kids hear you call them by the name that makes them feel loved and held by you. And may they hear that today and in all their days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. You may go back to your seats this morning and, oh, sure. <laughs> Let us continue in prayer. Lord our God, speak to us now as you have spoken to your people throughout the ages. Affirm for us the gracious blessing of our redemption in Jesus Christ and inspire us to live as your faithful, joyful people. Amen. The word of the Lord today comes to us from Ruth chapter 4. And the book of Ruth is found in the Old Testament. It's, it's tucked between Judges and 1 Samuel. And the story takes place in the town of Bethlehem. And it is a story about how generous blessings can arise from difficult circumstances. Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate 
and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Milan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Milan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrath and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then the Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mike and I are fans of Downton Abbey, a historical British drama, television, and movie series. And the second movie, which was released a couple years ago, opens with an unexpected phone call. A production company wants to use the estate to make a silent film. And this request becomes the talk of the house from top to bottom. Now, Lord Grantham initially declines the offer. Until Lady Mary, his daughter, convinces him otherwise. 
Mary takes her father into the attic during a rainstorm, a place he hasn't been in a while, to see the leaking roof. The payment from the production company would be enough for the repairs. But the retired butler, Carson, he's not thinking about money. He's astounded that the estate would be used to make a film. It's not proper etiquette. It's an endangerment. The crew might steal something, break something, who knows what something. Most of the other servants, however, they're, they're thrilled to serve the Hollywood stars. This Downton Abbey movie is a slice of life in the story of a family and their community. And so too is the book of Ruth. Naomi returned to Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was beginning. She arrived with Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. It was an unexpected arrival. Many years before, Naomi, along with her husband Elimelech and their two sons, had left Bethlehem during a famine to live in the country of Moab. Their two sons married while they were there, but then tragedy struck. Elimelech and the two sons died. Now, perhaps the community in Bethlehem wondered from time to time if Naomi would return one day, though not without the three men in her life, and definitely not with a foreigner like Ruth in tow. But Naomi did. And these two women became the talk of the town because, well, no one was quite sure what to do with them. Now, it did help. The Lord had given his people laws about how to care for the poor, the widows, and the foreigners in their midst. And the people of Bethlehem were also faithful in living their lives in ways that honored the Lord. Yet one person, by the name of Boaz, was highlighted in this slice of life story. Boaz noticed Ruth when he came around to check in on the harvesters that were working in his barley fields. Ruth was there picking up grain that was left behind. The harvesters were being faithful to the Lord's law that called for them to leave some of the grain, to let it fall to the ground so that those in need could glean for food. Now Boaz asked his overseer about Ruth. The overseer knew exactly who she was because, well, that's what happens when you're the talk of the town. If the moment Boaz connected the dots to what he had heard and what he was now seeing there in his field, his kindness reached out to ways, to Ruth in ways that went above and beyond what was required. Boaz extended the gift of belonging to Ruth when he met her in the field and addressed her as daughter. He extended the gift of protection to Ruth when he told her to stay among the women who worked in his fields. That way he could keep an eye on her and ensure that no one lay hands on her. Boaz extended the gift of additional provision Ruth had access to the water jars while gleaning, and Boaz subtly ensured that Ruth always went home to Naomi with more than enough food. Over time, Boaz sensed that Ruth was a woman of noble character. She was committed to Naomi's well-being, even herself going above and beyond in extending kindness to an old widow. And this encouraged Boaz to make an oath before the Lord to ensure that the protection and provision of these two women would be settled far into the future 
And Boaz acted on that oath in a timely manner. And that's, that's the portion of the story that we read from a few minutes ago. Boaz made an oath before the Lord, and the next day he went up to the town gate and sat down as the guardian redeemer came along. Boaz needed to settle the matter with this man, for he, not Boaz, had the first rights to Naomi's land. What unfolds then in the conversation, though, it's, it's strange to our ears. I mean, matters today aren't settled this way. The customs then were very different than the customs today. That being said, what we witness as this story unfolds is Boaz following through on his oath in a timely manner so that Naomi and Ruth would be cared for into the future. Now the guardian redeemer and Boaz, they needed to sort out who was going to redeem, i.e. purchase the land rights to Naomi's land. Naomi's deceased husband had probably made arrangements for his land before leaving for Moab that, that needed to somehow be closed out due to his death and Naomi's return to Bethlehem. Though to redeem the land also meant that the guardian redeemer would take responsibility for the care of the living family members, that being Naomi and Ruth. And then to complicate the matter even further, Ruth was still of the age to bear children. The guardian redeemer would be expected to assist in bringing forth a male heir to inherit Ruth, to inherit Naomi's land. Well, the guardian redeemer was unable to meet all of these responsibilities. And his reason being that if he redeemed the land, he might endanger his own estate. No, this man wasn't wrong. He wasn't sinful in not doing so. He simply realized that he might not be able to care for Naomi and Ruth on his own into the future. And so he gave his right to Boaz. And that was the oath Boaz made before the Lord, that if the guardian redeemer did not redeem the land, then Boaz would. Boaz's oath. It, it causes me to, to wonder about the oaths we make before the Lord. Now, I'm thinking of oaths in, in broad terms. We profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. We identify ourselves as belonging to the community of God. We say with our lips that we want to be faithful in living our lives in ways that honor the Lord. These are oaths, promises we make to act a certain way. A commitment to being Christian, not only in name, but also with generous hearts and kind deeds. Yet, what might be holding us back from living with generous kindness towards others? Where might we not be extending the gifts of belonging, protection, and provision in a timely manner? These are questions that we may prefer not to ask, but perhaps should. I know I often find myself overthinking and second-guessing. I get all tangled up in the what-ifs. So what if, what if others think I'm, I'm meddling? What if they don't want the attention? Uh, what if my words or my deeds do more harm than good? Uh, what, if, what if I don't have enough money 
What if I don't have enough energy or, or resources? These what ifs, they lead me to assume that it's all on me. And I begin to feel overwhelmed and I start to drag my feet and my trust in the spirit diminishes. Yet the spirit may very well have placed this particular person on my heart or in my life for a reason. And so too will the spirit provide me with what I need to live with generous kindness towards others. Because the grace, the grace is that nothing has delayed the Lord God from settling the matter of our redemption. From the beginning, the Lord God made an oath to his people. I am your God, you are my people. And even when human faithfulness wavers, the Lord God continues to work towards redemption, no matter what the cost, no matter how great the sacrifice. The Lord God brought forth life from Adam and Eve. The Lord God saved Noah and his family from the flood. The Lord God promised Abraham that he would grow from his offspring a faith family as numerous as the stars. And the Lord God was also working behind the scenes when Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. Those laws about gleaning and the tradition of the guardian redeemer created an opportunity for Boaz to extend the gifts of belonging, provision, and protection. Though, for the Lord God, the matter of redemption extended beyond the slice of life that we have in the story of Boaz, Naomi, and Ruth, and the community of Bethlehem. Because what we're really witnessing here is not the birth of just one baby, but the birth of two babies. The first, Obed, born to Ruth and Boaz soon after the people of Bethlehem just heaped blessings upon their marriage in the Lord's name. Boaz had made good on his oath and, and praise was due to the Lord who had worked through Boaz to settle that matter of redemption. The second baby to be born, however, was much more hidden in that moment in time. Yet the Lord God was actually working there in Bethlehem on a much grander scale. Obed grew up to become the father of Jesse, the father of David, who was a multiple great-grandfather to Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus. And Jesus, the Son of God made flesh, born in Bethlehem, would grow up to die on a cross at the immensely high cost to redeem his people from their sins. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have been given the gift of new life that is secure into the future. For we who trust in God, who believe in the name of Jesus, we're made children of God, living in the power of God's grace and for the sake of God's kingdom. What we witness in the book of Ruth, it is a picture of what new life in the family of God is meant to be and at its best. Boaz's above and beyond generosity and kindness were highlighted. Yet so too was the whole community of Bethlehem. 
the people of Bethlehem also noticed the return of Naomi and the entrance of the foreigner Ruth. The people welcomed these two women into their midst and among them. And together the community vowed to keep these two women protected and cared for. They may not have been able to redeem Naomi's land to the extent that Boaz did. Yet the people were still there, present at the town gate. They were there offering their blessed support to the newly married couple, praying for the Lord's blessing upon them. And it was indeed a sweet, sweet fulfillment to an oath made before the Lord and acted upon in a timely manner. And this, this is how the Lord God so often acts in this world. That is through faithful people to extend the gift of belonging within the family of God to others. The book of Ruth, a slice of life story tucked within the pages of the Bible, is meant to inspire. Back then, and here now are faithful people of God living in a moment of time, living as those who belong to God and serve within the kingdom of God. And we too are encouraged to be oath keepers, generous and kind, enfolding and embracing, caring for one another, even if there is a cost. For in doing so, we are joining God and making known the greatest of all redemptions through Jesus Christ. I recently finished reading the book, Joining Jesus, Ordinary People at the Edges of the Church. In this book, it's a collection of stories about people of God responding to the Spirit's invitation to share themselves with their neighbors and to join Jesus by loving people in the ordinariness of life. And this book, it just so happens to highlight people and congregations associated with the Christian Reformed Church denomination. Now, in one of the vignettes, a vignette titled a lot of redemption. A young adult named Catherine testifies to her experience of growing up in her parents' biological home. Now, her parents had intentionally opened their home for needy children. Many of these children needed a peaceful space to escape abuse or from the dangers of the street. And Catherine acknowledged that her parents' decision, well, it took away from the time that she got to spend with them. And she had to share her bedroom. Yet, she still believes it is a blessing. She has witnessed God's grace at work in her family home over and over and over again, a grace that she would have missed out on if her parents hadn't opened up their home. And she's quoted as saying, I certainly now have much more empathy when it comes to how other people live and what they have to cope with. It's really rewarding to be here we see a lot of redemption happening in our home. A lot of redemption happening. Jesus taught his followers along the way, several times in fact, that is in giving away our life that we will find life, life abundant, life given back with blessing. It is in taking up our cross and following the way through redemption that each one of us finds ourselves together 
and in need at the foot of the cross. It is in laying down our lives for one another that our joy is made complete. Because it is in the giving of ourselves, in being Christians not only in name but also with generous hearts and kind deeds, that the Lord uses us too to make redemption through Jesus Christ known and to grow the community of God. Boaz was blessed when extending the gift of belonging to Naomi and Ruth in ways that I don't think he could ever imagine. Mary and Joseph were blessed when extending the gift of belonging to Jesus in ways that I don't think any one of us could ever imagine. The community of Bethlehem, twice in the Bible, was blessed when extending the gifts of protection and provision. And we too will be blessed in ways that we have yet to imagine. Because that's, that is what happens when we offer ourselves with generosity and kindness to the Lord God's plans to settle those matters of redemption. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. Lord our God, continue to speak to us as we move through our days so that we may love those who come among us like you love us. That we may be present to our neighbors like you are fully present to us. That we may extend friendship to others like you offer grace. And in so doing, may we delight in being who you have made us to be, your handiwork. In Jesus' name we pray, and with gratitude for our redemption in Jesus. Amen. Join us in standing and singing. Oh, how good it is.
his word till the whole earth sees the redeemer has come for he dwells in the presence of his people how good it is to embrace his command to prefer Forgive as He forgives when we live as one. We all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord and we Please join me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together, Lord. Uh, it's been a wet number of days, and, uh, but we, we know those are needed. We know that after a dry winter, that the, in a dry summer last year, that uh, the rains are coming when they're needed to help replenish the land, to uh, renew things as necessary during the springtime that we're coming upon as well. And, uh, you know, sort of a... Uh, similar to here at Westside, Lord, where we've come through a, a dry time, Lord, we've come through a time of uh, trials and tribulations, and we look forward to uh, a time of renewal and, and uh, your hand to be upon us. So we thank you that uh, Janet and Mike could come um, this weekend, and we pray for the time they've had here and for uh, that your hand would be upon them and us as a congregation, and, and your discernment and, and your guidance will continue to be with us, Lord, because you know the plans that you have prepared, and we just ask for your spirit to um, be upon all of that and the decisions to come. We thank you for the many things you provide to us, Lord. We know we come to you with lots of time with our laments and our grievances, but we thank you for all the things that, that you bring for us, Lord, that uh, we live in a safe country and, and we have so many access to so many things so readily, and we thank you for um, you know, baptisms that happen. We thank you for good medical care for that Perry's dad could uh, receive uh, a pacemaker and, and return home. We thank you for those things, Lord. Um, we pray for all the continued work that's going to go ongoing for nominations, Lord. We pray for, uh, we thank you for those that have served and whose time is, uh, of service are coming to an end. And put your hand and spirit upon those who, uh, you know, will hopefully fill this, those positions, Lord, and that there will be, um, again, new viewpoints and, you know, um, we are not all uh, the same people and we all have differences, but those differences help us to listen to each other as well and that we can, um, you know, serve your kingdom as, as you see fit. Lord, we um, ask you to be with those who grieve for Asher Van Loon with the passing of her sister, um, for many others, Lord, we pray for um, our family, Lord, for um, Christina and her dad and, and uh, Stacy and, and Luke and Natalie, Lord, and the passing of her brother still. Lord, please be with those many who are sick, Lord. We, there's so many that we routinely bring to you, and we, we know um, that you hear those prayers. Um, Lord, we will offer just a couple minutes of time here just to sort of Bring those, those immediate things that we have in, in our hearts and minds uh, so that um, people can bring them to you silently.
Lord, we also just along those lines of celebration, Lord, we thank you for the upcoming anniversary for Westside, Lord, that uh, 40 years uh, of, of time here to serve the community, Lord, and we just look forward to many more years of, of uh, serving each other, serving the community, Lord, and, and all that, that you know that we need to bring here. We thank you for the work uh, as well, those that we support throughout the world for the Barnhorns and the Matos family, Lord, and their mission fields. Lord, we ask you to bring them fruitful endeavors, Lord, and, and that they will help grow your kingdom um, for the work of the Khois as well as they work uh, with Geneva and Momentum Campus Ministries. And we thank you for the growth and the, um, the program as well and, and how many university and college students it can reach. Lord, just be with uh, you know, our local leaders and our, and our government agencies, Lord, that they will um, be fair and equitable and, and that uh, we will help provide for those who are less fortunate than us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Sherry, I'm your duty deacon, and um, as always, we have a chance to give to the West Side Ministries budget, but we also have a special offering that we always designate, and today's is for Safe Church. Safe Church is now being called Thrive, and that is because it has joined with eight other Christian reform ministries to better equip and encourage congregations, and their purpose is still the same. They're still committed to equip congregations in abuse awareness, prevention, and response. And they help communities where the value of the person is honored, where people are free to worship and grow free from abuse, and where abuse has occurred to have the response be compassionate and to serve justice that fosters healing. Thrive offers training and support to volunteer Safe Church members so that they can be resources for their congregations and classes. And team members provide learning opportunities and support and consultation in their own local contexts. So I'd ask if you could pray with me now. Father God, we are thankful for the safety, the love, and the acceptance that we have come to know and anticipate finding in our church home and our church family. We ask you to accept our praise and use our best gifts to help build community among us. Where there is challenge or difference, we pray that your example will inspire tolerance and a clearer vision of our goal to be serving you. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit. Take this blessing of God with you into your week. May God's bountiful love sustain you, and may you love those who surround you. May God's spirit empower you, and may you empower all you encounter. And may God's joy fill you. And may this joy overflow to the ends of the earth and to God's glory. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
May you.